Welcome to the Mary Mack Show, where we will be talking about your feelings, experiences, and pain following the death of a loved one. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you find yourself in this entire world, I welcome you. How are you doing, my friend, my warrior? I hope it's been a better week for you. Last week, we spoke about what happens when we couldn't say goodbye to our loved one before they died. So many ways, including COVID, that separated us from being near them. Earthquakes, sudden death, including homicide and suicide, are just some additional ways we didn't have the chance to be close to them when they died or were killed. Not to mention all the practical reasons you couldn't be there. Distance, finances, your own ill health, job responsibilities, family responsibilities, and so much more. Today, I'd like to talk to you about what really can help you as you walk through your grieving process. If you are hearing me very soon after a loved one has died, or before a memorial service is planned, there is no more perfect way to honor your loved one than making those ceremonies personal to you and to your family. Remembering the little things that they loved and intertwining them in your services is a lovely tribute to their life. If they loved purple, then purple balloons or flowers would be a nice touch. If they loved a certain piece of music or type of music, how wonderful to add that to your plans. If they loved jazz, why couldn't you use soft jazz during the wake and as part of the ceremony instead of the sad funeral music that most of us seem to believe is mandatory at church? But no one said it had to be that way. Creating beautiful obituaries that will memorialize many aspects of their life is a lovely way to remember them. No one said it has to have just the standard information, like relatives that are surviving, their mini resume with all the types of work they did, where they grew up and lived their life. No doubt everyone looks for that. But what if you added about their hobbies, the things that brought them joy? Like how they loved gardening and canning their favorite tomatoes and jams that people came from miles away to purchase those jams at the farmer's market each week, that people flocked to hear them sing at the local pub, that their favorite vacation with their spouse was the train ride across Canada. So many things that can be included in an obituary other than the basics. It makes their life come alive. And if you are preparing a eulogy, remember to tell stories that people will love. It is not irreverent to laugh in church or synagogue. Actually, I believe it lightens the sadness and the mood when so many are hurting. 
What about the funniest stories you remember with your loved one? The most loving stories? Was it how overjoyed they were upon the birth of their grandchildren? Or perhaps how a couple felt so blessed to have adopted after all the pain of infertility? Ask other family members and friends for their special memories with your loved one who died and incorporate them during the services. And don't forget to extend an invitation to others who may wish to speak. They also have their stories to tell. Now, if you are further along since the death of your special someone, you might consider gaining comfort from these suggestions. It is important to keep talking about them. Don't bottle up your grief. Telling the story of their life as well as death makes it real. And although it's quite painful, it helps you move from the shock phase into the reality that they are not coming back. While at the same time, we are letting the world know they lived and you loved them and their passing has greatly affected you. If we stuff our pain down inside ourselves, we risk illness, stress, anxiety, and depression, and we cannot act like this is no big deal. This is a major big deal, and one that has changed your life. Give it the respect it deserves, the time it deserves, and the expression of all types of emotions that it deserves. And during this process, one of the key releases of pain is through crying. Crying lets out our pain, and we need that. We should never suppress ourselves from crying out our pain. It is cathartic. It is natural and normal. For some of us, we think of it as a sign of weakness. But that's not the case, and you have been through a traumatic loss, especially if it was a sudden death. And your body, mind, and heart are all in shock. You need to let your feelings come out. You will do more harm if you suppress them. Sometimes this may lead to screaming and wailing. When we have been told about the death of a loved one, it is not uncommon to simply collapse in sorrow. We cannot believe the news and find ourselves wailing and crying continuously until our system catches up with what we have just learned. The shock of learning someone has died makes us stop in our tracks especially when that person is significant to you, and it takes time just to comprehend what has happened. At first, we can't believe it. It doesn't seem real, and we question whether it's true or not. And crying, wailing, and screaming out in disbelief is all part of it. Even months later, we can still find ourselves crying at times when we think about them and how they died. We might also weep because we are now missing them, and how our own life has changed now that they are no longer with us. We might even feel great anger about how they died and that they've left us. Anger is a large part of death. Anger at the person who died for leaving us, especially if they had control over it, as in the case of suicide. Anger at the person or persons who have had a hand in their death, such as homicide or a drunk driver. Anger at ourselves for what we think we could have done. And we have to deal with that anger and slowly move along but it will rear its ugly head again at times. Suppressing our anger at whomever it needs to be directed at will only harm us inside. Anger at ourselves can stir inside and lead to depression and illnesses, and we don't need either. We need to know that releasing anger is a necessary step in the grieving process. 
another source of strength can be found in prayer. Now, for some, prayer is not on their radar for whatever reason. Maybe they think prayer is silly and reserved for church people, and they weren't raised in church or synagogue. But actually, prayer can be a very calming way of dealing with grief. Prayer is simply speaking to God. It doesn't have to include prayer books or devotionals or anyone's interpretation of the holy books. It can be you having a conversation with God, wherever you find yourself, telling Him how you're feeling at any given time. If you're calm, He is listening. If you're angry, He is also listening. I remember a minister saying that God is big enough to handle your anger. Your emotions are no surprise to him. He made you so he knows exactly how you are, how you deal with sadness, how you deal with sorrow. I believe there is no one else like you, and there never will be. You are a unique human being. Use prayer to comfort you console you, quiet you. That connection and relationship with God can help you to not feel so all alone. And no, you may not receive all the answers you want, but I believe He hears us and wants the best for us. He knows you are hurting and missing your loved one. Take some time to simply talk to Him through prayer. It doesn't have to be any set of fancy words. Just speak with him like you would speak to any other person. Tell him your fears and all that's going on for you. Ask him for strength to move forward. Ask him for other things you need. Then sit quietly and just listen. Sometimes you'll be reminded of something to do. Sometimes you'll remember a person to connect with again. Sometimes you feel drawn to a new avenue. Whatever comes up for you, take it seriously and do it immediately. Don't question it. You've gotten an answer and you need to honor that answer. Another very useful practice is allowing others to help you. You might believe that it will be your original circle of family and friends who will be there for you along your journey after a death. But more than likely, you will find most of those original people who are in your lives may not be the ones who walk you through this pain. It actually turns out that other people will come into your life from out of nowhere. It might be a neighbor who takes the time to check in on you brings you dinner, helps you with caring for your children so you can have some peaceful time to grieve alone. They are the ones who listen to you over a cup of tea and just give you the space you need to tell your stories about your loved one and what's going on for you. All of us need to be heard when we are in such pain, and we will be surprised who comes to help us. It might be someone we haven't been in touch with recently. It might be friends who have also experienced your same type of grief, and now they want to lend you their experience of what worked for them. Yet we must learn to accept their help, not isolate ourselves thinking we can get through this all alone. That will not help you. Next week, we will continue to talk about other ways to help ourselves through the grieving process. So for now, take these ideas to heart and think about which will work for you. I'm sending you big hugs and much love. So now it's time to get up and dance, dance, dance. Wiggle and move your body even if you're in a sitting position. I know you think this is wacky, but please just do it anyway for me, okay?
you so much for listening in today. Remember to write five things in your journal each night that you are grateful for. Visit my website, marymac.info, for your free book. Please subscribe, rate, and review my podcast wherever you listen to me, and share it with those who would benefit from it. And if you would kindly support my podcast, you'll find a link for that on my site also. And as always, remember to be happy because you deserve to. I'll speak with you again soon.